This woman thinks that she's here today on the show to tell us her remarkable story of lost love and lost family. And she is. But what she doesn't know is she's also here to meet for the first time in her life the largest part of her family, who until now have been thousands of miles away and unaware of her existence. Hello, how are you? stories like the one you're going to hear today. In fact, uh, it came to me from a letter that this woman wrote to a friend of mine who's an Australian. In fact, you may have seen him on the show, John Michael Housen. And John Michael passed on the story to me. And it's, as you read the letter, as you know this woman's story, you keep on saying to yourself, if this is true, it's going to make a magnificent book or a movie. But it develops even as we talk today. So I want to bring her out and begin telling you her life. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sharon Crystal. Sharon, come on out. Hi, Sharon. Come on, take a seat. Now, Sharon's story begins in my homeland of Australia, and um, it was a love story. It began as a love story, didn't it, Sharon? It was a love story. Uh, my father was an American serviceman, and my mother a blue-eyed blonde Australian, and they met when my father's ship was in Sydney in 1948. And um, they had a wonderful love affair. It was short, but it was obviously very intense. Uh, my father sailed back to America probably a month to six weeks after, after they met, and uh, then my mother found out she was pregnant. And of course, in those days, the stigma was uh, uh, pretty horrific for young girls to be having illegitimate babies, let alone double whammy with an Afro-American baby as well. So, uh, yeah, it was very intense. I must explain, because maybe Americans don't understand, that at that time in Australia, it was not developed that uh, there was a white Australia policy that yes. prevented people immigrating to the country who were black or any other colour other than white which meant that your natural father, even if he had at that point known your mother was pregnant with you, he couldn't have come back to live. No. They wouldn't have let him. So you can understand the atmosphere in which when you were born, black babies were not part of anything that anyone wanted anything to do with. That's right. That's right. So this is the yeah. world you enter with That's a white right. mother. So when did you realize that... Well, look, continue telling the story. Well, my mother lived with her mother and her mother was just totally non-accepting, absolutely. There was no way that this black child was coming into her home. No way. And so my mother... What was the worst thing she said about you? The worst thing my grandmother said to me when I met her, I didn't meet my grandmother until I was 12. And uh, she said to me, you are the worst thing that ever happened to my daughter. Somebody should have drowned you at birth. Uh, she, this lady had a real problem with this. My mother was the youngest of eight, very beautiful. Uh, she, uh, my grandmother was just bitter and twisted and just could never deal with this. So ever. your mother, with nowhere to go, no husband and a baby, right. and yeah. where did she put you? Well, she gave me to some friends of hers. Uh, well, I, actually, I don't know. The first three years of my life, I really don't know. And my mother doesn't talk about this story. My mother really doesn't. So the information that I give you is what I have learned uh, just, just as I've learned along the Passing way. Passing And you're in the middle of finding your family right now, which we'll get to in yes, a minute. Yes, that's right. So the first time you become aware, though, that there is a family around you is when you're living with a, two black women in Sydney. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I was living with these two black women in Sydney who were friends of my mother's. And I have a feeling that it was in their home that my mother met my father. And this house was a great house, a great house. Uh, it was a party house. And these women used to entertain American servicemen whenever the ships were in Sydney. And they were so delighted to take care of me, so delighted to take care of me. 
and I had a great time in this house. I had a wonderful time. Your letter was beautiful. It talked about the American jazz records the servicemen would bring oh, and play. Your first yeah. memories. Yeah, well, this house, you've got to imagine, I'm a three-year-old child, right? The ships would come in. All the American servicemen would go to this house. It didn't matter if it was 10 o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock at night. The music would go on, the booze would flow, and these people would have a party. You know? <laughs> it was great. And I had a party. I loved every second of it. And the Americans would bring me nougat and candy and stars and stripes pedal pushers, you know, and just spoil me so much. And, uh, yeah, Ella These Fitzgerald, two black women Nat loved Cole, you. the music was played. This is, and then, by the way, your career today is? I'm, a, I'm an entertainer, I'm a singer, Bec yeah. <laughs> and a lot of that early music, obviously. Oh, always, so, believe it.